<laughs> Acts, Acts chapter 7. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. I'm going to bring you a message tonight on doctrines to die by, or to die for, however you want to entitle it. Doctrines to die for. There are some things that are really worth dying for. And I'd like to maybe talk about five or six of those things, however far the Lord will allow me to go, and whatever the Lord will allow me to do, I'll do. I really, uh, I really don't care about doing anything else but what God wants me to do. Amen. You'll never realize the amount of pressure that comes from people to do what they want you to do. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they'll threaten you with about everything, you know. All right, Acts chapter 7. Most of the chapter deals with Stephen a Christian in the early Jerusalem church preaching to the lost, unsaved leaders of Israel in Jerusalem before a group of men called the Sanhedrin, which was the, really the body of religious and political leaders of Jerusalem at the time, right after the Lord's crucifixion. And he was given this opportunity, the Obviously, the Lord does open doors, and this man who was chosen as a deacon in, the, in chapter 6, uh, because of his great wonders and miracles, uh, he, was called up to the, uh, uh, he was called up to the Sanhedrin. They brought him there. They, uh, they, they brought him there and then brought men there to testify against him that he was blaspheming the name of God, preaching about Jesus Christ and preaching against the holy place and the law. And uh, <clears throat> you'll find all that in the latter part of chapter 6. And then, Peter, or then Stephen begins to preach to the Sanhedrin in chapter 7. He's given an opportunity when the high priest says, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren, fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham and he begins right there with the history of Israel with the father of Israel Abraham and he goes down through and gives them kind of a capsule view of, of Israel from Abraham to the present time through their rejection and crucifixion of Jesus Christ and of course it's certain times during his message he's got them all amen in it I mean he's talking about their ancestors and he's talking about their heritage and what a great heritage it was. And then every time he gets them all built up, but he said, you wouldn't listen to them. And you stoned the prophets. And you wouldn't listen to men like Abraham. And then there'd be kind of a hush on the meeting. It'd get real quiet. And he continues to preach to them down through verse 53. And start with me in verse 48. After he talks about Solomon building a temple, he says, How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or where is my place of rest? Hath not mine hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers. Who, uh, uh, some years ago the Pope uh, said that the Jews were no longer guilty of killing Jesus Christ. The Pope is the biggest liar that ever walked on two feet, and you can tell him I said so. Amen. They were the murderers of Jesus Christ, and if some Pope said they didn't do it, that doesn't mean anything. That just goes to show you that's the wrong church. Amen. And I'm not saying the Baptist church is the right church. They had, they had no right church. Get saved. And then get into a Bible-believing church. 
When they heard these, when they heard, and he says, yeah, and then he says in verse 53, talking about them who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. Uh, they were shown by God that they were guilty. But what did they do? They didn't repent. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Doctrines to die for. He talks about the coming of the just one, the Lord Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh, the Savior of Israel, and they had rejected him. And then he saw the glory of God, Jesus Christ, standing at the right hand of God, having something to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ to establish a great kingdom to Israel. And they didn't want to hear that either. They were satisfied with the kingdom they had. They said in John 19, we have no king but Caesar. And they had chosen their kingdom, an earthly, worldly kingdom of wickedness and ungodliness and rejected the righteous, holy, spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ. And because of that, because of what he revealed to them and God smote their heart with conviction, you know, when you can't get rid of guilt, you try to get rid of what you think is bringing the guilt. That's why folks don't want to come to church. They get guilty. They don't want to get right, so they just don't come and get guilty. These folks got mad, and they got so mad they, they killed Stephen. They stoned Stephen here in this chapter, and this man died for what he believed. He believed that Jesus Christ was the just one. He believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah to Israel and that he believed that they were totally wrong in what they had done and they would pay the price for what they had done. He believed that so much he died for what he believed. I believe there are some things in this Bible that you and I ought to consider so important that we would be willing to die for them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless me now. I pray you'll fill me with the Spirit of God. I pray you'll help me to minister to these people some truths, some teachings, some doctrines that are worth dying for. God, bless this message. Lord, I trust it into thy hands. Only you can do it. Forgive me of my sin. I'm not worthy to be a preacher. I'm not worthy to be saved. But by your grace, I am what I am. And I thank you, dear God, for saving me. I thank you, Father, for calling me and using me, Father, to be a blessing to some of your sheep. Please, dear God, allow me to, to shepherd these folks and to lead these folks to be an encouragement to these folks. And I ask you especially, Father, that you'd allow me to preach the gospel tonight to the lost, that they might be saved, that they might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might not go out into eternity lost without Christ. And I ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Take your Bible and turn back to Mark chapter 4. I'm going to try to do a little more teaching tonight than I uh, am preaching. I can't promise you. I really start out to do that quite often. But I want to talk to you about some things that are doctrinal. Doctrine is not, um, well, it's just not glory preaching. You understand what I'm saying? Doctrine is learning some things, and when you have to learn, your brain has to get engaged. A lot of glory preaching. You don't need much brain to get glory preaching. You just need good feet, wavy hands, bubbly hearts, receptive minds, and that sort of thing. You can get a lot out of it. But doctrine is something else. You have to study a little bit. You have to think a little bit. Mark chapter 4, notice what it says here about the Lord Jesus Christ with his disciples, uh, verse 1, he began to teach 
by the seaside, and there was gathered uh, unto him a great multitude, so that he entered in a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and then he teaches the parable of the sower. And that was his doctrine. Those were his teachings, that what you sow, you reap. And when you sow to some places, it, it brings forth one thing. When you sow to others, it brings forth another. Those are things that are absolutely true. Uh, what, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's a teaching. That's a doctrine. Turn now to 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's what, a, that's what the word doctrine means. It's an absolute truth that should be taught. Your children need to know what is absolutely true because that world will never tell them what's absolutely true. Their friends will only guess at what the things are. I mean, can you remember people trying to tell you things about life when you were a kid and trying to explain certain things to you? You know, what some kid thought it was. 1 Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse... 12, Paul said to a young man in the ministry, he said, Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation. See, notice the conversation is a little different from word. Conversation is what you do as much as it is as what you say. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, that's having the right attitudes, in faith, doing what God told you to do, in purity, till I come, give attendance to three things. A young man who wants God to use him, who wants to be used of God, he said give attendance to reading, spend some time, a lot of time reading. Some of you do not have the self-discipline to sit down and read a book. And, uh, and he said, if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be used of God, if you're going to be an example of the believer, if you're going to have the right words, the right conversation, he said, if you're going to have the right attitude, the right faith, the right purity, he said, learn how to read. Listen now, listen now, listen now. I realize that before you got saved, you may not like to have read. Some of you probably didn't even learn how to read. But now that you're saved, you need to learn how to read and learn to read. You need to do it. You just need to tell your body, shut up and sit down, open the book and read. Amen. You say, every time I read it, I read about five sentences, my mind wanders, and I don't remember what I read. Read it again. You just keep reading it again until the flesh finally gets the message that you're going to read it until you understand it. Discipline your mind. You know what the people were that followed Jesus Christ? They were called disciples. That's where the word discipline comes from. Don't you ever call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ until you're ready and willing and able to do what he tells you to do. Discipline to say, I'll read, I'll go, I'll do whatever he says. Give attendance. Quit cutting school. Be there. Give attendance to reading. To exhortation. Now, exhortation is uh, the kind of preaching that exhorts you to do something or some of the things that will help you, to, like being with other Christians when they're doing what God wants them to do. Be around people that are doing something for God. That exhorts you to do something for God. Give attendance wherever you can be exhorted. I tell you, every time you come to church, there ought to be a time of you ought to be exhorted. He's, uh, over, the, over in the book of Hebrews chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, Paul said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. When you come to church, that exhorts you. It encourages you. It should. I mean, if you, can't, if, if you come to church, you don't get exhorted. It, 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 the problem is either with us or with you. Now, now look, when 150 of us get exhorted and get encouraged and you don't, Don't come to me and say, oh, there's just something missing around here, preacher. Yeah. 
Yeah. Your willingness and your attentiveness and your heart being right with God. That's what's missing. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, any time somebody's preaching that can help you do right, be there. See, I haven't got time. Well, you tell God about it. What you're really saying is you have not, you don't have time for God. I'm going to tell you how to, you know how to have time for God? I can tell you how to do it, but you won't do it. Give him all your time, and then you won't mind giving him part of it. You know why some of you can't make it to church and some of you can't make it to the offering box? You've decided you're only going to give God part-time and God part of your money. And every now and then you decide that you even need to keep that. But you see, if you gave him the whole pile and then he said, okay, you can keep 90%, you'd say, praise God. Amen. And if you gave him all of your time and he said, you can go to work. You can take your wife out to eat. I'll give you the time to go to the grocery. You'd say, praise God, hallelujah, I go to the grocery. Amen. Well, who's running your life? Yeah. Who's laying out your schedule? If you're still laying it out, it's a wreck. I think some of you believe in evolution. You think it's getting better without God? It's what every evolutionist believes. It's getting better without God. Uh-uh. It's getting worse. Entropy. You give it to God, and He'll make something out of it. Every minute of your time, every dime in your pocket. How, can, how do you suppose He said, that a man is to give as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, for God loveth a what? Cheerful. cheerful. You, know how, you know how you can be a cheerful giver? Give God all 100%, and when he gives you back 90, whoo! That'll cheer you up. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. That's part of it. Balance it. Doctrine's a part of it. You ought to know some definite teachings, some definite truths of the Word of God. Those, are, those things will stabilize you. Those things will ground you so that you won't be uh, blown about. The, the problem with the Pentecostal is he does not understand the security of the believer. He does not understand the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. If he really understood those things, he'd never get caught up into. He, hey, he does not understand the doctrine of Israel. The signs are for the Jew. If he understood those things, he wouldn't get caught up in that movement. Every heresy, every heresy group is a doctrine that's perverted. You know those doctrines, you'll never get caught in those doctrines. And you'll never get caught in those cults. You'll never get caught in those groups. And you won't waste your money and your time on the wrong thing. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation. Well, what can you say? It says it. Why do I think that I have to just keep preaching on that? I don't know why, but there's just something in me that says some folks aren't listening. Hey, I'm talking to my duck. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you can take your pick as to how you fit the picture. Amen. I'm trying to get you into the duck business. Amen. I hope you get what I'm saying. Sometimes you talk to people and they don't think you're talking to them. When Paul said, he said, oh, well, he's talking to Timothy. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Every word in here is for you. Amen. And especially here in the Pauline books, it's to you. Look, 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 look. If Paul told a young man that was how to be a good example, what would you do to be a good example? 
I mean, my goodness, man, can't you figure out one and one is two equals that and equals equal? If it's good for somebody else, wh why are you the exception? I'm not the exception. I've got to give attendance to exhortation. If I don't get exhorted every once in a while, I turn just as sour as some of you are looking at me right now. Amen. I get just as backslidden as any Christian. I need to read my Bible. I need to read about men of God. I need to read biographies. We've got a library down there with hundreds of books. Some of you have never taken the first book. Why? My, my, my. He did say give attendance to reading. I read the newspaper every night, preacher. Oh, man. Turn to Philippians. I'm glad you said that. Philippians chapter, Philippians chapter 4. Do you, that's why, that's why you can't get the dirty thoughts and you can't get the dirty expressions out of your heart, out of your mind, is because you just keep pumping that stuff in your mind. Yeah. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing. You want to solve the problem of worry? Let your request, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, well, that'll do away with the newspapers right there. Amen. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, underline it, think on these things. Amen. You want the peace of God? Then find things that are pure, things that are good, things that are honest, books that are right, and spend time in those things and meditate on those things, and it'll straighten your mind out. It'll straighten your heart out. Isn't the Bible wonderful? Amen. It really is. Hallelujah. I love it. I haven't even got into the message yet. Every one of my messages is turning into a series. <laughs> you think I'm kidding you? Last week I preached on Sunday morning the introduction to that how to move God. Making God move this morning I preached the first point. I got three points to go. Doctrines to die by. Folks, it's absolutely necessary to know a little bit about doctrine, to know some basic doctrines, to give attendance to them. He says in verse, uh, in back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Live right, know what's right, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And he's not talking about salvation to go to heaven. He's been talking about a man's ministry and call or whatever God's given him to do. I don't care what it is God's given you to do, just raise a Christian home or just to or have a Christian home or just to be a, Christ, a good Christian for the Lord. If you want to continue, if you want to be faithful, if you want to be successful, if you don't, oh my goodness, do you know how many times I've stood in this pulpit and said, it's good to see this many people here, but I wonder who won't be here next year? Do you know how many times I've said that and then one, two, and three, and four, and five, gone, 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 gone. Why? What happens to people? People come to you and say, why did they quit coming? Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Folks just don't continue. They do it for a while and then it gets repetitious or it gets, you know, it just gets dull or something. I don't know. But, but they just give up doing it and they just uh, lay it aside for a while and take a vacation. I'll tell you, the devil does no vacation on his calendar. You take a spiritual vacation, you're looking for trouble. David took a vacation. He never got over it the rest of his life. He should have been on the battlefield. And he stayed home.
When those doors open, you're to be on the battlefield. It's a battle to go to church and drag kids to church and get yourself ready and come to church. It's a battle. Don't tell me it's a battle. Every one of you go through it every time you come. I don't feel good. I'm tired. It's raining. It's a long way to go. It's dark out. There's all kinds of things the devil will come up, say to you. First Timothy five seventeen. The reward of doctrine. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Folks that labor in doctrine, God rewards them. Titus chapter 1, the power, the abilities of doctrine. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 7, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of... What kind of men? Sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You know you can't, you can't combat heresy by creating a heresy. You would not believe the number of heresies the Baptists have created to try to combat heresies. You know, year, a few years ago, all the kids wore long hair, so all the Baptists said, you know, they said, now look, if you kids think, you're, think you've got a right to have long hair because you think Jesus had long hair, you're crazy. Jesus didn't have long hair. How many of you heard that screwball stuff? Jesus Christ had long hair, Deuteronomy 22, Leviticus 19. And I'm not, I'm not call, I didn't say he was a Nazarite. They'll always come back, you know, and say, well, he never took a Nazarite vow. Listen, my Bible said he, filled every, he fulfilled every jot and tittle in the law, and the Nazarite vow was in the law, dummy. Where were you when they passed out brains? I know behind the door it said, I'll take one train, and that was all you got. You've been riding around circles ever since. Amen. I'm telling you what, you, you know, the Charismatics come out, and the Pentecostals come out with tongues, and the, the Baptist, he runs over to First Timothy, or First Corinthians chapter 13, and that which uh, shall be done away or that which then tongues shall be done away or some crazy thing like that in First Corinthians. It has nothing to do with speaking in tongues today. It has to do with languages. Hey, man, there are still languages. you got people still speaking French. There are sp people still speaking pidgin. There are people still speaking Italian, uh, Spanish. Languages haven't been done away with. I mean, you just create heresies to combat heresy. That's not how you help people. You help people by sound doctrine knowing why the thing is not for today and showing them right from the Scriptures why the thing is not for today. Amen. But it helps to have a consistent spiritual life to back up what you're saying. I want to give you some basic doctrines. This is kind of a mini course on theology that are doctrines important to the believer, to every believer. I believe that a Savior that is thoroughly God is a doctrine worth dying for. So it, the, the Bible uh, talks about Jesus Christ being God manifest in the flesh. In theology, that's the study of Christology, the study of Christ, that he was fully man, and yet, fully God, thoroughly God. Every Christian must know. You see, folks, every heresy, every cult in the world does away with the deity of Jesus Christ. And every Christian needs to be thoroughly, 
uh, in, uh, grounded in the doctrine of Christology, that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I wasn't saved by a good man. I'm not relying upon the teachings of a great teacher. My faith and my trust is placed in God himself. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus Christ and said, Good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, Why callest thou me good? He said, There's none good but God. If Jesus Christ wasn't God, he wasn't any good. And you can't trust him for salvation. You better find another God to believe in. That's a doctrine worth dying for. If he wasn't God, Paul said, we're of all men most miserable because he's still in the grave. He's never been risen from the grave. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll get to 2 Timothy 3 a little later. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He was revealed in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. The Spirit that enabled Him to work those miracles justified who He was. They were His credentials to deity. He said, if you believe not my words, check out my works. He had the creative powers of the Creator. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. The mystery of godliness. It is a mystery. Everybody that's unsaved cannot understand the teaching that Jesus Christ was fully man, born in a virgin womb, born God, in a man. People say, I just can't understand it. Quit trying to understand it, just believe it. Amen. I don't understand electricity, but I believe it. And I believe in it, and I utilize it. I don't understand all about the Trinity, and I don't understand all about the deity of Christ, other than the fact that the Bible said that He was God manifest in the flesh. Amen, that's all I can tell you. He was God manifest in the flesh. He had the attributes of a man. He got tired, he got hungry, he got weary. But he also, he also revealed the, man, the, the uh, characteristics of Almighty God. On that boat, when the sea was raging and the wind was blowing, he stepped out on the bow of that boat and he said, Peace, be still. And there never been a man do that. That's a doctrine worth dying for. Why, preacher? Turn back to Exodus chapter 12. Because you and I, we needed a spotless lamb to pay for our sins. We needed somebody to die in our place. Exodus chapter 12, from the very beginning, God taught his people that the only way to pay for their sins, the only way to cover their sins was through a spotless, unblemished, clean animal sacrifice. Gen Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. And the very first month, the very first part of that month they had a Passover. Verse 3, speak unto the congregation and saying, in the tenth day of this month shall they take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall, uh, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly, the congregation of Israel, shall kill it at the evening. And that's what they did to Jesus Christ. They crucified him on Calvary's cross, and the Bible said it was dark on the face of the earth for the space of three hours. They killed him in a time of darkness. And they shall take the blood, verse 7, and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. I'll tell you what, when you get saved, there's bitterness. When a person's under conviction of sin, there's a bitter eating of herbs. 
There's conviction of sin. There's sorrow of heart. There's something bitter when you take that lamb. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you realize you're a hell-bound sinner, a hell-deserving sinner, and if God's wrath would come out right now, it'd strike you dead and put you in hell, and you come down and you fall on your knees, and, oh, God, I'm a miserable, wicked, wretched sinner, and I deserve to go to hell. Oh, that bitter herbs. But eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his heads with his legs, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it, until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. You shall eat it in haste. Why? Because God's wrath is coming. And he's giving a man a way to escape the wrath of God. For I will pass through the land of Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is a type of the world. He said, I'll pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beast, and, ex and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Thanks be unto God, I have a Savior who was thoroughly clean, thoroughly spotless. If Jesus Christ was a man, he was a sinner man. If he wasn't God, then he, was a, then he was a lamb that had spots and had blemishes. And I'm trusting in a sinner to save me. And no sinner can save a sinner. It takes a sinless man to die in your place, to take your wrath upon you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, that's to be bought back because you're, you and I were sold under sin. Redeemed. We're not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't buy forgiveness for sins. He said you're not redeemed with silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 3, for Christ, verse 18, also hath one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put death put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus Christ was God Almighty in the flesh. When he was born, he was, he was born sinless. David said, I was born in sin and, and iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. But when this little lamb, when Mary's little lamb was born, he was born of a virgin womb. One day they put him in a virgin tomb. And three days later he walked out of that tomb because he wasn't a man like you and I. He was God Almighty in the flesh. You and I need a spotless lamb to keep us out of hell. God has provided for that lamb. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which beareth away the sin of the world. When you come to Him, God takes all of your sin and puts it on Him, takes all of His righteousness, puts it on you, Amen. and you got the greatest deal that was ever handed to man. Amen. That's a doctrine we're dying for. There's no other doctrine that will keep you out of hell but the doctrine of Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh, dying for a sinner. I needed a spotless lamb to die for me. God would not accept the blood of an animal. Those were but types and pictures. What he wanted was an eternal man to die for an eternal soul that had sinned against an eternal God. And when he died on Calvary, God's wrath fell on him eternally, and he suffered the pain of hell and all the agonies and tortures of hell. And he said, I thirst, I thirst. The Paschal Lamb is burning. Thank God I've already been burned. I remember a story, and you've heard it over and over again, I'm sure, many years ago the wagon trains went out west. As they would go out and cross the prairies out there, many times the grass would be tender, dry, and would catch fire because of the sparks uh, or for uh, lightning or things like that somehow get going, a big fire going, and the wind would begin to move that fire across the prairie. And as those wagon trains moved out there, they learned how to backfire. And what they would do is they would dig a trench about 8, 10 feet wide, and then they would start a fire uh, coming toward that trench, and they would burn out an area 
a, a, a wide area, maybe uh, two or three hundred yards, and let it burn down to that trench, and it would burn that area off. And then they would drive all the cattle and all the animals and all the uh, people into that area. And the fire came up there, and the fire stopped when it got to that place because it had already been burnt. I'm in Christ. Amen. Amen. May the 19th, 1968, I got into him. I've already been burnt. Amen. He suffered my burning for me on Calvary's cross. Amen. I'll tell you what, a Savior that's thoroughly God. He's God. He's not a pope. He's not a preacher. He's not a man. He's God. Don't take anything less. He's a great high priest. He's the highest priest this world has ever known anything about. A salvation that's truly a gift. Turn to Romans chapter 6. I believe in when you study the doctrine of salvation... But in theology, it's called soteriology, the study of the salvation of a damned and doomed race. <laughs> Just to be as brief about it and as short about it as I can, in Romans chapter 6, some things that you need to know about that is that, uh, let's look first of all in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's nobody in here that's never committed a sin. There's nobody in here sinless. And God's not, God's not, He's not real interested in how big a sinner you are or little a sinner you are. God's just interested in the fact that you are a sinner. The Bible said, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. God wants a payment for sin. Jesus Christ made that payment on Calvary's cross. Amen. Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He died for you in your place. Because you sinned against him, God said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. One sin damns your soul to hell. You say, preacher, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter what you or I believe. That Bible says if you commit one sin, that's proof positive you're a sinner. What are you going to use to pay for that one sin if you've only ever committed one sin? You can't be redeemed with silver and gold. And those are the most valuable things on the face of this earth. There's only two things that God will require to pay for your sins. Number one, your soul burning forever. Or number two, the eternal man, Jesus Christ, dying for your sins on Calvary's cross. Amen. Either payment God will accept, but that's all he'll accept. Either your soul dying forever or the soul of Jesus Christ suffering and dying for you on Calvary's cross. They'll pay for your sins. All have sinned. Man is lost, lost, lost. He needs a Savior. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Don't let anybody leave from now on. I, I, I'm really serious. What I'm talking about here is vitally important to every person in here. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The payoff for sin is death. That's all you and I can earn. We can but earn death in this life. I don't care how good a person lives, how wonderful that person is, how nice that person is to everybody around them. Sooner or later, death will be their lot in life. Death has not missed on anybody yet except one man. All I merit is death. But he says, though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 2. The payoff for sin is death. The price of salvation. What, is, what does God demand for salvation? He demands sinlessness. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul's talking to the Ephesians here, and he was talking to people who were just like you. You hath he quickened. Make, that means to be made alive. Who were dead. Where? You see, a sinner is dead. If a sinner has committed one sin, God said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The sinner is dead spiritually. One day his body will die physically, and if he doesn't die saved, his soul dies forever, burning in hell. The second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. My friend, none of us can get out of the first death, but you don't have to experience the second death. You might be headed for dying physically. That's the price. That's the payoff for sin. But there is a price for your salvation and somebody has paid the price. God demands absolute sinlessness from us and somebody has paid it. Jesus Christ has lived that sinless life. All you have to do is believe in Him and you have the sinless life. Ephesians chapter 2, he says... But God, verse 4, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. For by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? That in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through what? See, it is, God isn't kind to us because we deserve it. He's kind to us because of Christ. He deserves it. And if you will believe in Him, then whatever you deserve, you get through Him. You and I deserve to go to hell, but through Him we can go to heaven. You and I deserve the wrath of God, but through Him God will have mercy upon us. Any salvation that's not truly a gift is of the devil. Amen. Paul said, If any man preach any other gospel than that which I preached unto, him, unto you, let him be accursed. That's the Bible word for damned. For by grace are ye saved through what? Faith in Jesus Christ. And that, that faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God gives you the faith to believe. He tells you you're a sinner. He tells you Christ died for your sins. He says, come unto Jesus Christ and believe on him and have everlasting life. Read the whole book of John. God wrote the book of John that you might have life and that you might know that Jesus is the Christ. God wrote that whole book so you could know that. So you wouldn't have to die. Listen, everything is prepared. All you have to do is just get in on it. It's a free gift. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It, 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 salvation is the gift of God. Listen, folks, if I handed, if I handed Brother Cleese my Bible and said, there, Cleese, I want to give it to you. I, I've made a down payment on it. I paid five bucks. There's 20 more dollars owed on that Bible. And you finish it off. That's not a gift. That's a responsibility. He has to work to pay that off. But if I hand him, say, if I come to him and say, look, Brother Cleese, that Bible cost me 50 bucks good money, and I worked for it, and I paid for it, and it's absolutely free and clear. There, you can have it. That's a gift. A gift is something somebody else paid for, and they want to give it to you whether you deserve it or not. In this case, we don't deserve it. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is dead, but the, uh, uh, the gift of God is eternal life. Listen, my brother, my sister, my friend, my uh, man, woman, child, God wants to give you a free gift. If anybody tells you you have to do something to earn your way to heaven, that's the devil incarnate. I, that, don't die for that doctrine. 
But bless God, you can die for that one that tells men they can be saved by God's grace. Black men, white men, red men, big men, little men, women, children. Anybody can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody can come. You start putting stipulation on it and you'll cut somebody out. You start saying, well, a person's got to go to church. Hey, the thief on the cross couldn't get to church. That's a damnable heresy. But, brother, it's worth fighting for it. It's worth living for it. It's worth dying for it. That men can be saved by just faith in Jesus Christ. A salvation that's truly a gift. A security that testifies of grace. Romans chapter 5. I believe, I believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. I believe in the salvation of the grace of God that's a gift by faith to a, to a sinner. And I believe that once a sinner has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, there's nothing, nothing, nothing that you can do to get out of salvation. You're saved forever. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall, future, Amen. be saved. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? How long is everlasting? It's amazing when people say, well, I just believe you can lose your salvation. I say, what kind you got? You might have temporary. It might, I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about temporary life. It just says about eternal life and everlasting life over and over and over and over again. I mean, if you got some kind of temporary life, you didn't get the kind the Bible's got. You need to, you need to, you know, you need to junk that like a dead horse. Get you a white one. Romans chapter 5. I, I, I tell you why this is so important. When you believe that Jesus Christ was God, that will separate you from every cult and every screwball teaching in the world. And when you believe that salvation is by grace through faith, that will cut it down even thinner. Amen. And then when you say that once a person is saved, they're always saved, I guarantee you that will put you about as far out as you can get. How long is eternal? And it's a free gift. When he gave it to you, you didn't deserve it. How do you figure you're going to deserve it now? Amen. I mean, you were in far worse shape when he gave it to you than you are now. <laughs> oh, I just think I've sinned away my day of grace. <laughs> Boy, that, that's a fine old Christian text, isn't it? Out of the book of uh, what was it? Hezekiah. That's where that's at. Romans chapter 5. These are doctrines we're dying for. This is the doctrine of security. Look, folks, if you're not secure in God, let me tell you something. You, you yourself are going to vacillate. You're never going to know whether you're in or you're out, and you're never going to be able to help anybody else get in. You know what makes a product easy to sell when you're convinced it's the absolute best? And, man, you talk about a product. I'm selling the best product in the world, and there's no cost. And everybody needs it. What a, where in the world? You, I mean, I, there's nothing to Taco Bell to compare with that. I mean, there are some pretty good things at Taco Bell. I love tacos. I love burritos. But, brother, I, I love that burrito supreme. But I, nine million burrito supremes ain't like salvation. Amen. Boy, salvation doesn't cost anything. Romans chapter 5. I believe in a security of the believer that testifies of the grace of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, now Paul has concluded everybody under sin in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, and then he said that only way anybody can be saved is by grace through faith, justified by Jesus Christ, by just believing in chapter 4. And then he follows it up with this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have... Peace with God. I'm not waiting to get peace with God. I've had it for nearly 20 years. Amen. When it comes to my salvation, I know exactly where I stand. My standing is in Jesus Christ. I'm created in Him unto good works. I'm His workmanship. If there's anything wrong with my salvation, you have to blame it on God. Amen. Salvation's of the Lord. It's not my salvation. You can lose yours, but you can't lose His. Amen. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, whatsoever the Lord doeth, he does it forever. Amen. Romans chapter 5. Tell you what, Cliff, I'm having a hard time. 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Oh, listen, I'm telling you what, nothing in this world can shake a person with peace. You can't scare them with death. They've got peace with God. Don't threaten me with killing. I mean, if, I mean, if the next instant you'd be, with, you'd be in glory, how can you threaten somebody like that? What can you do to threaten anybody that knows they're saved and knows they can't? Listen, that's like I said to you last week. There's nothing I can do that'll make God love me more. And there's nothing I can do to make God love me less. Amen. Nothing! Oh, some of you, you have a hard time struggling with that, don't you? He says, verse uh, 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's what I am. I'm just ungodly. I'm not like God. God wasn't born. You see, you might be, a, you might be just about the best fellow in the neighborhood, but you were born of a man and a woman who had a depraved nature. That's not like God. Amen. He's always been there. Amen. How are you going to live? How are you going to match up with one who's always been there when you haven't always been there? And you ain't always going to be here. Amen. See, your nature just won't make the grade. You need to be born again. He died for the ungodly. That's what I am. Over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it said Christ died for our sins. That's what I did. That's what I do. That's what I'm going to do. You know what Christ died for? My sins. You know what that means? That means everything I did do, am doing, and will do. Because all my sins. Who oh, in that deep? He didn't die for my past sins. That's not what it said in 1 Corinthians. You, you stuck that in there. He died for my sins. And then in Romans 5, He died for what I am. Amen. Here's life. You go through life, tell a lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. God writes it down. You go through life, you take something that doesn't belong to you. You steal. Thou shalt not steal. You go through life, you curse. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And for some of us, boy, it's... <laughs> Got that? Uh, yeah, up here too. Oh, I'm telling you what, it starts adding up. It starts adding up. Just take, just take 10 sins a day. You know how many that is in a year? 3,660 in one year. How, long, how old are you? 32. Just multiply 32 times 3,600. All that starts adding up, and all that guilt starts pressing down on that heart, and the man gets concerned. And he said, boy, I've got to do something about this. Self-righteousness. No, no matter how much he brushes that, that stuff's still on there. He tries to cover it up. You know, like Adam and Eve getting, a, you know, the little apron. And it won't work. You can still see the dust. He tries the best he can. And then he, he gets it all covered up and he lies again. And he steals again. And this time he commits adultery. Oh my, you say, preacher, I've never done that. The Bible said if a man look upon a woman to lust after her, he hath committed adultery with her in his heart already. Amen. The Bible said whoso hateth his brother in his heart is a murderer. And you know no murder hath eternal life. Some of you committed murder. We all have committed murder, haven't we? Some of us have hated. Boy, we get all those sins against us. We get out that old self-righteous, the rags of self-righteousness. We start, oh man, i got to... Hide those things. I got to do a few good things, you know. Send a little money to Boys Boys Town. Yeah. Send a little money to the United Way. Let my kids go to church now and then. Yeah, yeah. But just don't get rid of it. I know what I'll do. I'll join the church. I'll get baptized in water.
Hey, that did the job. What's left? A blackboard. The sinner's still there. One day, somebody tells me about the gospel. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be, be saved, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins through his blood. You have these precious promises whereby ye are made partakers of the divine nature. God comes along and says, Goodbye, blackboard. <laughs> That's what God does, brother. He just gets rid of the board. He died for our sins. He died when we were ungodly. When we were without strength. We were without God. He died for us. He saved us. I believe in the doctrine of the security of the believer. Turn to Romans. I lost my Bible. I don't know what I did with it. Okay, Romans, Romans chapter 6. Yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? This doctrine is to die by. Romans chapter 6. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Continue on in chapter 5 there. I, I don't have time to read it all. I wish I did. Much more, verse 9. Being now justified by his blood. See, I'm not waiting to get justified. I am justified. I'm being justified. I'm under the blood of Jesus Christ. Who apply, who, that blood was applied by the eternal spirit. So there's no way I can get out from under the blood. I believe in the security of the believer. Much more, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through what? Him. Him. He just got rid of me. For if when we, when we were enemies, when we were unsaved, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by what? There's nothing you can do in your life that makes any difference. It's His life that saves you. You say, well, that just gives me a license to sin. You just go ahead and try it. God will knock your head off and take you home early. The Bible said, Brethren, you're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh, Romans 8, 12. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You want to stay around a while and be a blessing to somebody? Just live for God. You want to go home early? Just go ahead and think you got a license to sin. God will fix your wagon real quick. You'll be sanctified in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. The, you won't hear the trump. Romans chapter 5, verse 15. But, well, let's start verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin into the world, Adam, and death by sin, since he sinned, he brought death. And so death passed upon all men. Why? Not because we're from Adam, but because we've sinned. You got a nature that leans towards sin, but the reason you die spiritually and the reason you go to hell is not because of Adam. It's because of you and I. We decide to sin. We choose to sin. We rebel against God. And we pay the price. Or we let Jesus pay the price. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? Talking about Jesus. But... Now read very carefully. Not as the offense, what Adam did. So is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, what Adam did, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. You say, that's kind of strange talk, and I don't quite understand. Let me just give it to you like this. Number one, you got yourself into it, but somebody else gets you out. You see, as, as the, uh, not as the offense, so is the free gift. Adam got himself into the mess, but somebody else got him out. You see, 
The free gift is not like the offense. Adam, in a sense, Adam got us into this thing, Jesus gets us out. There is some similarity, but it's not exactly alike. Number two, you, did you know you can get out of the first situation? But you can't get out of the second situation. That's all right. Some of you won't get it, but some of you will. Yeah. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. <coughs> the first situation, you could die and go to hell with it. But if you get saved... There's no way you can get out of being saved. Number three, oh, hallelujah. One sin got me into trouble with God. But when God forgave me, He forgave me of all my sins. But not as the offense, so is the gift. The gift isn't like the offense much more by what? The grace of God. I, don't, I wouldn't give you five cents for anybody teaching a doctrine that a Christian is only, only past saved and his future depends upon his works. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches a security that testifies of the grace of God, an abundant grace. I'm not under law, I'm under grace. Romans chapter 6. Next, the Bible teaches... The doctrine of the scriptures, bibliology, the scriptures that transform us into a godly person. Here we go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll tell you, listen, salvation, the Savior and security of the believer, those are doctrines to die for. Those are, those are the greatest doctrines in your Bible for you and I. There, there is no peace without Jesus Christ. He's the Prince of Peace. There's no peace to a hell-bound sinner outside of salvation. And there's no peace to the saint of God without the security of the salvation experience and his position in Jesus Christ. And the thing that brings it all to us, this knowledge, this understanding, this security, this salvation, the knowledge of that Savior are these scriptures. The scriptures that transform. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul said to Timothy, verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Why is the Bible so important? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. This Bible can give you a new birth. It's like I said before, your first birth is not at all like God. You need a new birth, a spiritual birth, like the Son of God who was born of the Spirit of God, that you might be a child of God. 1 Peter chapter 1. How does all that happen? Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Now, I want you to stop right there and listen to me very closely. Do you know how I know that the King James Bible is absolutely 100% perfect without any errors, without any mistakes? Because if you don't have incorruptible seed, you cannot have an incorruptible birth. Rome, uh, Luke 8, 11 says the seed is the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible. You know how I know man had nothing to do with this? Oh, you say preachers, 50-some men back in 1611 wrote it down. Yeah, they wrote just exactly what God told them to write down. Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost. If you sow to the flesh, what do you reap? Not of corruptible seed. Then flesh had nothing to do with that book. 
I don't want flesh having anything to do with my second birth. Flesh got me into a mess the first time. God is my father, and the Bible is my mother, and both of them are sinless. Both of them are absolutely perfect. Thereby, when God Almighty speaks to me and I believe the Word of God, God the Holy Spirit and the Word of God mix into my heart and produce a born-again Christian. I'm born of the incorruptible seed. He says, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. My friend, if you don't, if you don't have a, a sinless book, you will never have a sinless nature inside your body. You're going to be exactly the way you are the rest of your life, and you're going to die and go to hell. Amen. But if you want to be saved, and if you want to have the nature of God, turn, if you will, to 2 Peter chapter 1. You can have it by just believing the precious promises of the King James Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1, Paul, or Peter says in verse... For whereby are given unto us exceeding, and gr exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. If your Bible has one man given or man made error in it, it's corruptible and you can't have a new birth, you can't have a divine nature according to the verses that I just read. I believe in scriptures that can absolutely transform us to be like God. I have a godly nature. Now, you're not looking at it. My flesh hasn't changed a bit since I got saved May the 19th, 1968. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's a new creature inside that was born of the Spirit of God the day that I believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And something changed in my life. Did you ever read the life of the Apostle Paul? Over there in chapter Acts chapter 8, he's consenting unto the death of Stephen. Kill those Christians. Slaughter those Christians. Put those Christians in prison. Then Acts chapter 9, he meets the Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate word on the road to Damascus, and he falls down on his face, and he falls under conviction, and he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus sends him out to preach. And the one that was persecuting the church is now preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened to that man? He got a new nature. Amen. He got a new nature, a divine nature that completely changed the way he thought, completely changed the way he acted, completely changed everything about him. Unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to stay just like you are and get worse at it. Amen. All the bad habits you got now, they're going to multiply into worse habits. You know what you better do now? Before you mess up your life completely and get too far gone with your life, you ought to turn your life, your soul over to Jesus Christ. He'll change it. He'll make it new. He'll make it right. He'll make it clean. He'll make it incorruptible. I believe it's a doctrine to die for that that book there can impart life to men. That's what everybody in this world needs. They need that book. They need to know what's in that book. They need to be partakers of the divine nature. If they're not made partakers of the divine nature, straight to hell. That's a doctrine worth dying for. Scriptures. That'll transform. Turn to Acts chapter 1. I believe in the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus Christ that one day will transform us to glory. Translate us, I'm sorry. Translate, transport, whatever you want to put in there. Acts chapter 1, verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, this is after his death, burial, and resurrection, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Take your Bible now and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible promises, prophesies, predicts of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Literally, physically. He left literally, physically. He left with a body of believers. He'll return to a body of believers. He'll return literally and physically. He left uh, a specific place on this earth, and I suppose he'll come down to a specific place on this earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Paul says to the believers <coughs> at <coughs> the church of Corinth, Behold, I show you a mystery. 
Now here we go, we've got another mystery. We already talked about one, about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people that can't understand that. A lot of people that have trouble with the Trinity, the deity of Christ. And a lot of people have trouble with the second coming of Christ. The Bible says here, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You know what, you know what this world does for you? It sticks, it sticks signs on buildings and says, new image. <coughs> you can get a new image here. <coughs> Beauty shops do that all the time. And you go in there, and they do your fingernails, do your eyelids, do your eyebrows, do your hair, and you walk out, and it rains. <laughs> but listen, when God gives you a new image, and when God changes you, it's forever. Amen. And all the rains of this life, and all the storms of this life, and all the trouble of this life, will never touch that new man that's on the inside of the believer. And one day we're going to be changed permanently and perfectly. And he says we'll be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Hey, 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 what if you're sitting here tonight? The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ could return at any minute. He said, In an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh. What if Jesus Christ comes tonight? And the trumpet blows, like I'm about to read here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so them also which sleep, the dead Christians, which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He'll bring their soul back from heaven where it is right now. Their bodies in the grave, the souls in heaven, they'll ride back with Jesus Christ. God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We won't go ahead of them. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That, that scripture right there teaches me that Jesus Christ is coming back, and it doesn't say when. It just says, when the trumpet blows, he'll descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. What if he came tonight? Yes. But you know what? If it happened, if the, the Lord split the skies tonight and shouted tonight, Come up hither! Rome, at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And all of the saints dropped their robes of flesh the Bible said, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Every human body in here would fall to the ground, just a lifeless hunk of flesh with the blood all over the place. And the saints would rise out of here, and all that would be left would be sinners. Boy, that would be a terrible, terrible experience. In an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh. You know what the Christian's looking for? I'm not looking for the tribulation to happen. I'm not looking for anything to happen. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior. The Christian is told all through the history of the church age to look for one thing, the coming of Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body and fashion it like unto his glorious body. One day he's coming back. Are you ready? If you're sitting next to a Christian, you know what would happen? When that trumpet blew, you would turn and that Christian would be gone just like that. And you'd look down and all the clothes would be laying there in a pile and all the blood laying on the floor, all intermingled with those clothes. And the stark reality of heaven and hell would descend upon your shattered soul and it'd drive you crazy. Hundreds of people gone and there you and just a few other people sit. And then you'd begin to scream. Brother, I tell you what, you, would, you talk about a nightmare that a person would never forget. Never, never forget that. 
I'll tell you what, you don't have to be in that condition. I started out talking about a Savior that was thoroughly God. and He died for your sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I talked about a salvation that was truly a gift. God wants to give you that gift tonight. Why? So that when He comes back and He blows that trumpet and He calls out His believers, you'll go. Or if you die before that happens, Paul said, For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I'm in a strait betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul said, We are confident, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I'm telling you, tonight you can be saved. Tonight you can know where you're going when you die. Tonight you can have your sins forgiven. Tonight you can have the peace of God in your soul. Tonight you can have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Tonight you can have everlasting life. And tonight you can have the peace and assurance of knowing that if the trumpet blows, you won't be left behind by those that are saved. You'll be flying off through outer space with us. Are you saved tonight? Let's bow our heads. As Brother George and the pianist comes, I want everybody just to stay in their seats, just bowed, please. Oh, my precious soul, listen to me, friend. Your soul is in the balance here tonight. The devil would like to damn your soul to hell forever. But Jesus Christ wants to save your soul, and there's a battle raging now between God and your soul.